thing because the people who come here know the people who have come here. So uh, I'm really excited about this day. I, and I've already seen some things, some smiles, some, uh, and, and I had somebody kidding me a couple of days ago, one of our faculty, well, this is this year, the next year, well, no, well, let's just, let's just get through Saturday and see how it goes. But I'm gonna turn this over now and um, I'm gonna open us in prayer right now and then I'm gonna ask Ms. Linda Gottschalk to, uh, to, to join us and to lead us. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the work um, that you did and started through Dr. Evans and Dr. Johnston and their families. And we thank you that 30 years later, we're still here. We're here because of your grace, because of your providence. We pray that, uh, Father, today you would work for your glory, but also that you would work for our good our eternal good. Thank you. Thank you for bringing all these alums back. Thank you for allowing us to be privileged, really privileged, what you've done in and through this school and all the people who have taught and administration and who have studied here. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a little bit. Well, it's my privilege to uh, welcome uh, a special guest from the Chemente Harlem Mir here, Mr. John uh, Nadersicht. I didn't butcher your last name. Oh, it's great. It's great. <laughs> Yay, thank you. There's hope for me then. <laughs> anyway, he's here with us to, to greet us on, on behalf of the, of the Chemente, and uh, the floor is yours. Mark, I tend to speak a lot. <laughs> I'm still struggling with this kind of stuff. So it's not you, it's the thing. <laughs> it's quite kind of the place. It's, uh, okay. It should work. Okay. Um, what a start for me this morning. It's not a typical Dutch start, actually. And uh, it's more like uh, you, uh, you wake up and uh, you start with the children and slowly, but you start putting them to the hockey fields or whatever, field hockey. Um, and now I'm here. Um, my name is John Nederstig. He did a great effort, especially for an American, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I'm the alderman of edu uh, education of the city of Harlemia, amongst others. Um, <clears throat> and I'm proud, proud of Harlemia. We have 73 elementary schools. We got a couple of high schools. And uh, we have an excellent, really an excellent relationship with these schools. I think the schools are very important. And these schools typically work with uh, young kids from zero to 23 years old. Uh, we have kindergartens and stuff like that. And we help them where we can with, with permits with housing and all kinds of stuff and um, about 70 percent of the, the kids who live in Harlemere also go to school attend schools here in Harlemere and we are a very young municipality and for people who do, uh, do not know that yet you're sitting here around four to five meters which is about 15 to 18 feet below sea level <laughs> we did this with our hands and we are pioneers actually and I'm proud of that. And we are growing in many, many ways. And we have a strong ambition. <clears throat> and we have the ambition to have higher education. And I'm working very hard on that. And then popped in the invitation of the Tinder Institute. We have already higher education. You are the example of that. And we did not know that. Shame on us. <laughs> But we are very happy, actually, that we know it right now. Is my work done? No, of course not. But it's good to have you guys over here, actually. And it's something to be very, very proud of. But it says something about us, but also about you. You keep on doing the work. And we actually are a bunch of, let's say, farmers, actually. We work on this. 160 years ago, we started this, this this area, and we all think that it was to reclaim the land because we want to grow, but it's actually to protect 
It's a typical Dutch thing. It's protect the city. We didn't do that. There was no Amsterdam. And if there was no Amsterdam, well, you continue the, the story. <laughs> um, but you are here there uh, already for 30 years. And let's try to make one appointment. Let's, where we need to do that, but also where there is uh, a fun reason to do that, let's get in contact. And let's meet each other every now and then. And let's talk about how we can help, how we can support, or just inform each other what we are doing. Because we think it's great to have you guys over here also for the next 30 years. Well, let's not wait another 30 years. <laughs> I will at least spread a word around that you guys over here. I think that is a good start. And let me put it this way. We are very proud on that, that you're working on this, on any subject. And, and I will remember this Saturday morning as a great new start for that. I hope you have a great day. I hope you understand that my uh, schedule, even on a Saturday, is pretty busy for family business, but especially today for, let's say, political business. I can't tell you that it's a really business, but, but, but uh, you have to forgive that. I will uh, stay here to listen. Uh, a couple of minutes, but if you don't mind, I will squeeze silently through the door. And I hope you have a great day today that gives you inspiration for the future, but also something to look back for the last 30 years that you have been done. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nadersley. I'm so glad you could be here with us. We haven't met before, but thanks for coming along and helping it be such a festive occasion for all of us to celebrate. So, so now I'm up. I get to tell the story that many of you probably know better than I do, which is a history of Tyndale. Um, I know almost everybody in the room, but if you don't know me, if I don't know you, I'm Linda Gottschalk, and my husband is Dr. Phil Gottschalk, and he's in the back. You probably know him too. And we've been here for 15 years. I haven't been on staff all that time. I've just been on staff for the last five years. But um, my husband's been here all of that time teaching and has had many of you in class. So it's um, my privilege now, a little bit in the past and now in the future, to try to pull together something about the history of Tyndale. Because we're at the point now, 30 years on, that um, we can begin to look back at our history and say, okay, how, why are we here? But who would go up? What is this building? Uh, what has been happening in this building? And so I've put together this little PowerPoint that I already gave in chapel another time. And I want to say that this is only the beginning. Hopefully this PowerPoint and an enlarged version will eventually be on the website. And hopefully, Lord willing, I'm going to be able to write a little bit of history of Tyndale too, and that there'll be a small book eventually. But I'm still doing research. So if you have information, if you have thoughts, memories of your time at Tyndale that you'd like to share so that I can know and I can write about it, please send it to me. Please let me know. Please write it down or type it and mail it to me. And I'll be glad to get it. Well, we're going to start and, and say, here we are at Tyndale Theological Seminary, and our motto has been focused on Europe and reaching the world. That's certainly reflected by our multi, multicultural, multi-ethnic status. We hope that, that we're having an impact on the whole world, not just our local setting. Here we are in Badhuvador, as we've heard, a, a small place, a small town under the sea level. We used to be underwater here, but now we're above water. And we're training pastors, missionaries, Christian workers, <coughs> academics from around the world, hopefully to reach the world through Christ. Now, this school began in 1985-ish. 1985 were the first classes with nine students. First I heard there were eight, now I heard there were nine. Um, so anyway, we're going to get, get the facts straight, but there were about nine students, and some of you might be here from the very first class. Yes. Great. So you can you can uh, correct me later on any details that I might have gotten wrong. Also, there was a small team of professors and staff, and we'll hear more about them. So the, the story of his, Tyndale is really about a group of people that wanted to make a difference, and they had a vision to reach Europe and the world with the gospel. Many volunteer teachers, and of course the many students in New London who have been here, studied, and gone out to do things for the Lord. 
Now, we can't talk about the beginning of Tyndale without talking about Robert P. Evans, who lived from 1918 to 2011. Bob Evans. Now, he has an interesting story. Many of you know this story. Bob Evans was the founder of Greater Europe Mission, which was the organization that started Tyndale. And he was a missionary kid born in Cameroon. So he grew up speaking various languages, and he spoke French as a child as well. Now, in World War II, he became a chaplain. And he landed with troops on Normandy Beach in France on D-Day. Now, D-Day was June 6, 1944. That was the day of the Allied invasion of Nazi territory. And some people say it was the lar largest naval invasion in history. Anyway, the troops came to the beach. I'm sure you've seen this on TV. You've seen, seen photographs of this or, or shows, movies. Uh, so this was this enormous invasion. Now, he was a chaplain. He was a minister. So he wasn't a fighter, but he came with the troops. And actually, he was there, but eventually he was wounded. Now, the story I heard was that he was riding on a motorcycle and, and there was an explosion. But he was wounded and he was knocked unconscious. He woke up in the hospital and he found that he was in France and he could speak French to the people in the hospital, to the nurses and the doctors, and he began to talk to them. And of course, this has been the end of, it was getting to be the end of World War II. It was a terrible time in history. And he was speaking to people about things that mattered, about their souls, about eternal life, about life and death. And he found that many people in this hospital had no real Christian faith. And that surprised him. In fact, that shocked him. And he all of a sudden got this vision that, you know, Europe actually needs the gospel. Europe needs preaching of the gospel. Europe needs, well, missionaries maybe. Europe needs some help to regain its Christian faith. So he became convinced that Europe was a mission field. The mission field was not just somewhere else, somewhere else in the world but he was firmly convinced that Europe was also a mission field and needed um, to be reached for the gospel. Now, when he thought about strategy, he thought, first of all, about 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the verse, which is known to many of you, and I'll just read it. And what you have heard from me, from Paul, the Apostle Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, in trust to faithful men and women, who will be able to teach others also? Uh, here you see a diagram of Paul, the Apostle Paul. He taught Timothy, and then Timothy taught other reliable people. And they, in turn, taught others the gospel. So you see this multiplication effort. Teaching leads to spiritual multi multiplication. And because of this, Dr. Evans thought, yes, if we can multiply our efforts, especially working with national people from different countries, this is how the, the effort and the message of Christ can go much further than we could ever take it. And so Greater Europe Mission was begun, and it began working in a post-war, post-Christian continent. And you know the term post-Christian. Philosophically, Europe is thought to be post-Christian. Uh, it had a Christian background, but it can't really be said to be a Christian continent in the same way. So Greater York Mission began. It was founded by Dr. Evans and GEM, G-E-M. Greater York Mission began Bible schools to try to teach and to spread this 2 Timothy 2 to discipleship. So there were Bible schools and seminaries in, just quickly enlisting them, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Sweden, Belgium, Austria, and finally the Netherlands. York had been weakened by the two world wars the historic homeland of the Reformation, and the countries from which the ancestors of many North Americans had come, had suffered. And the Christian faith was almost non-existent in many places. So these schools were formed, and many are now independent of Greater York Mission. Others, a few don't exist any longer, but the efforts have gone into other, other channels. So you can see the, the big effort that this was. But when we think about Tyndale right here, we see that this was an English language seminary that was formed in the Netherlands for a reason. First, Dr. Evans really wanted to reach Eastern Europeans with Tyndale, but it soon became a much broader vision. 
because of the English language that's spoken in the Netherlands, because of the tolerance in the Netherlands, because it's a very, very friendly place for foreigners to come, many <coughs> students from across the world could come and benefit from this training. So Tyndale began a practical Master of Divinity program, and the location was found here in Bad Hoogendorp, near to Schiphol Airport, near to multicultural Amsterdam. Oh, oh it's oh, good. I'm trying to do it myself. Tyndale is named after William Tyndale, the 16th century Bible translator. Now, he was a Protestant scholar. He was a Bible translator, and he did the first translations into English of the Bible from Hebrew and Greek. Now, he translated the New Testament while he was studying in Germany. He was in exile from England at that time. Those translations were eventually smuggled back to England in bales of cloth, which is what was being produced at the time. So those were secret translations that he was doing while in exile. He also was here in the Low Countries from time to time. Now this was trans this was controversial because he opposed King Henry VIII's divorce, and also he thought that the Bible should be able to be read by every common person in his his or her own language. So he was eventually caught and imprisoned in Brussels, and he was actually killed in Vilvoorde, which is near Brussels. He was strangled, he was burned, he was a martyr for this translation that he had done. But his translation was a foundation for future English translations of the Bible. I could even say all future translations, because the way he translated the Bible was so influential on English, on the development of English, on the King James Version of the Bible, on Shakespeare, on every other person who's written in English afterwards. So um, the way he expressed himself, the way he phrased his translation was extremely influential. And so Tyndale is a figure that not only is about representing translation from Greek and Hebrew, but also represents the great value of the Bible and the great need for the Bible around the world. Good. Now, Tyndale here began when Dr. Evans, Robert P. Evans, began this seminary, and he had a group of people around him who worked hard and were really important. He was supported both financially and also uh, just by encouragement by the famous evangelist Billy Graham uh, and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. This is a picture of Billy Graham there, here at Tyndale. And he's pictured together with the first academic dean, Dr. Sam Faircloth, and also with Mrs. Arliss Faircloth there. Now, Sam Faircloth had been a church planter in Portugal for many years, and he had known Bob Evans, he had known Billy Graham, and he had also known, um, we'll talk from in a minute about Art Johnson. They had all been classmates together at Wheaton College, which is a really interesting connection. They had all known each other. And then when these ideas began to come out that, okay, we need to start a seminary, an English language seminary in the Netherlands, the Netherlands is a good place. All these friends came together. And the interesting thing is, none of them were young men at the time. Uh, now, I don't picture their wives too much either, although Arliss is there. None of their wives were young women. They came in their retirement years with a new vision from the Lord to start a new work after having had ministries in various <coughs> places. And I think that that is really inspiring. Now, Dr. Arthur P. Johnston, Art, or Dr. J, as I called him when I knew him, um, was the first president at Tyndale. How many of you know him, knew him very well? Yeah. Now, I, I didn't get have the privilege of working with him, but I knew him. He was a good friend of ours. He was the preacher at my husband's ordination service. He was his professor as well, and they used to pray together about missionary service in Europe. So there's a personal connection that we had with him, and we look back on that and, and really cherish that. He had been a missionary in Paris, France for over 20 years, and then he had been at U.S. schools. He had also 
importantly, been a professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, also called TEDS, that's outside of Chicago. And so there was a strong connection there with that school, TEDS. He, as I said, he had been a classmate with Bob Evans, with um, Billy Graham, also Sam, Sam Faircloth had been there. And so he and his wife, Muriel, as well as one of their sons, Jim, came to lead the New Seminary team. Now, he was a strong leader. I hear that he was a very strong leader when he was here. He had a, a firm direction, and he forged ahead, and he had some distinctives that he did not waver on. He was firmly evangelical. He believed in the Bible, and also he was an evangelist in his heart and in his heart and soul. He believed in reaching the lost for Christ. He believed in telling the good news of who Jesus is and how he could save us, how he does save us if we ask him. So he um, brought this to the new school. This is a picture of him speaking at one of the several conferences that happened in the Amsterdam area uh, in connection with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. This was the Conference for Itinerant Evangelists, Amsterdam, 86. Now, we're sitting here in this beautiful building. What was this building like in the beginning? Well, here you see the center part. I, I, I hope you can see how, um, how, how much work needs to be done here in this, this room. The center part of our building here, I hear that uh, it was once open to the elements, that it had been open as a courtyard. But this, I understand, was an elementary school, a primary school back before uh, we ever came here, before anyone from Tyndale came. This had been an elementary school, and Dr. Evans and Dr. Faircloth found this building. They found it, and they uh, had been thinking about different locations, and they decided on Amsterdam, they decided near Schiphol Airport was a good idea, and they found this building, and this building had been empty from the late 70s until 1984, so it was not in very good shape. In fact, Dr. Evans often slept in this building to protect it from squatters, to protect it from people who would come in and stay. And the building was not in good shape, but, um, but Dr. Evans and his wife, they were living in Paris, working in Paris, they would come up and they would, they would um, do a lot of things. They did a lot of things to renovate, renovate the building, to make alterations. They finally got it in good shape. And Mrs. Evans, Jeanette, remember her well also. She did a lot with the financial records in the beginning, keeping track of all of the renovations and all that. Now, many of you remember that chapel was not in this space, but it was in that center courtyard. How many of you were here when chapel was in the center? Yeah, I think the majority. For the majority of the school's history, that center part was not the library, but that was the meeting space, that was the chapel. And as many of you know, um, there was a big platform at the front, which was on that side toward the dining hall. Big platform, old curtains all around the windows, and a lot of people could sit in there. And that's where the meeting place was, the chapel, and sort of big gatherings. And also there was coffee at the back after a while, and I remember the coffee. I also remember how much the roof used to leak. I remember how the roof used to leak in that center part, and how it used to leak all around in the halls, and probably you remember that as well. Now, Dr. Johnson reflected on the early years in a publication that he sent out to donors in 91. So I'll just read this to you. Reflections on the early days. Our first class began in the fall of 1985, and the school was opened with very little knowledge of what the future might hold. As a new school, we had no alumni, no track record, no accreditation, and very little limited academic standing. Our library had very few books, no card catalog and minimal shelving. Our offices were sparse, sparsely furnished. We had one well-worn computer. What we did have was a vision and faith in God. We knew that he had given the vision for Tyndale and that the need for such a school had never been greater. Now, there were some challenges.